Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's getting steam. Yeah, it's really kind of scary. This supposed to be air conditioning, but it hasn't manifested itself. I'm just going to give you a spare cup. Just a second. No, you can. No, you can't. Yeah, it's not going to Yeah. Yeah, that's enough. Fine. You can put the fans on and maybe I'll put light. some windows. Yeah, no, if we find the fans. I pressed every button. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably burning me by the time. Yeah, it's working. Oh, no. Yeah. In the early days of the um, Starship Enterprise, click everything out, so now the ship will be. What's the problem? What's it? I'll just fill it up and everything will start. I'll show you what to grab the face, the top, because we're going to go straight from here to the top. That's why you need to be. We'll do some really basic stuff and then we'll do some slightly curved kind of stuff. Um, well, thank you for the huge mercy of your presence, that which I cannot get to talk about about it either, um, which is in itself one of the great mercies. Um, who, does, who needs a bugger here? Okay, I got my phone. Okay, so we'll probably jump around a little bit in Bagagina. Um, so if you need a hard copy, it helps on the phone a little bit. Um, I've been in lectures where I've got a phone and I kind of go, I wish I didn't have a phone with a book. Yeah. Like, I, I kind of keep my mouth shut and go, I've got a phone, I don't want to say I need a book now. But let me know if you need a book. How can you get a book if you don't want one? I can show you. I can show you after. Um, be careful of certain websites, as it is, in some of the purples and translations, there are some important words which are different to the actual uh, BBT text. So, um, at the moment it won't matter, because you're just getting into it, but later on it won't matter. Yeah, and there's vaderbase.io. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll try and know. I'll go for some Russell's wrapped, as Sucha does. Yeah. I'll try and get her some information from him, some links later on. I can, I can forward them to you guys so you can have a look. Yeah. So we've got a, a range of different audiences here. Some people who are familiar with the text, some people just starting. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take it back a few steps and then we'll just try and do something at every level if we can. Yeah. So, um, but I'll try and make sure it's in a way that everyone can get involved. So I've spoken. Um, um, before I, I'll do the prayer in a minute. Before I start, um, I spoke in before about one important um, rule here, which is often missed um, when you're starting this, uh, which is that um, Shri Prabhupada is an empowered, highly empowered, um, let's put, a devotee of the Lord. 
So his commentary, being a direct rep bona fide representative of Krishna, his commentary is on this equal level, well, it is an equal level in the text. So don't just read the text and avoid the commentary, because the, the, the juice sometimes is in the commentary. You know, I, I, I regard them as equally, sort of, you know, being a direct bona fide representation of Krishna, they're equal in, in weight. Um, so if you get stuck just reading the text, which is a good starting point, you then want to go into the commentary and get into that. And, um, and uh, Russell Rasha pointed out something a few, week, a few weeks ago in a lecture, which I always emphasise, which is that I found it easier when I started getting a notebook and writing out the commentary, which I think, you know, <coughs> you can't do the whole chapter, but if you go one or two verses which hit home to your soul, which everyone's different, and you write those out in a notebook, maybe two a chapter, and then flick over those, you'll gain confidence for familiarity. Mm -hmm. So building familiarity then develops confidence, yeah? So otherwise, it's such a big text. It's very, you know, very difficult for us, for themselves in Kali Yuga, to access that text very quickly. Um, so we have to build our confidence gradually, not then not. Um, and we'll talk more about that as well. So um, I shall, I shall do the prayers quickly, um, which hopefully will give me some mercy from Shri Prabhupada and the great saints to not make a complete fool of myself, a bigger fool of myself than I otherwise would. Om Ajana Timan Dasya Gyananja Salaka Kapsum Militam Yena Tasme Sri Guru Nama Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamaya and Tatiswa Pandikam. It's page one. Let's try to find it. Page one. Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Uta Padakamalam Sri Guram Vestam Sucha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragnodapitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Sabadutam Parijanaya Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Pisad Kampitam Sucha He Krishna Kara Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpati Gopesa Gopi Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanka Gorangi Radha Vrinda Vesvari Visabhanu Sutta Devi Pranami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpatrapascha Kripa Sindhubaya Evacha Patinanayam Bhavanabhayo Vestabhayo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Seva Sari Gaurabhita Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 I'll do a recap because obviously that you found that useful to have a basic recap. So there's a sort of, I said there's three levels of looking at verses. There's the first literal, you just read through the black text as you go through the book, which is um, relatively easy, if not a bit confusing. Then there's a level of the meaning of the words etymologically, what, what does a Sanskrit word mean, what kind of meaning comes out of that. And then there's a kind of the bigger picture meaning. And um, we looked at verse 1.1 to start the Bhagavad Gita. And um, that verse is, is a very basic verse. Um, uh, Dhritarashtra is asking Sanjaya, what did my sons and sons of Pandu do when they arrived on the battlefield? So, and the battlefield in Sanskrit is, is a holy place. So the commentary rightly points out to that first verse that Dhritarashtra is concerned about the impact of the holy place because he's not sure about whether his actions are right or wrong. Right? So that's the kind of two-level way of looking at it. But there's a third level of looking at this verse which opens up the heart of the Bhagavad Gita and what Krishna and Arjuna are going to be talking about for only 90 minutes or whatever it is. And that is this idea that my sons and the sons of Pandu, that phrase, my sons and verse 4.1, because ultimately, in terms of dharma, in terms of righteousness, Dhritarashtra should not be saying that. He should not be making a distinction between his sons and the sons of Pandu. He should be seeing them all as part of God. So that shows the discriminating mind that's under illusion. And that's how they end up in the battlefield, effectively. Um, there's a whole narration in the Mahabharata behind it, but that one verse explains his mindset. And his inability to see, as Krishna will later explain in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, with equal eyes, even that for us, equal, constantly, man of earth, even gold cow, sage, and so on. You know, he doesn't have equal divine vision or transcendental vision. So he's, he's spiritually blind, you can see from that verse. 
So we talked about that and we talked about the structure in Bhagavad Gita, just to recap. So there's effectively 18 verses, 18 chapters, and there's that's a sandwich. So the first six chapters are known as the Karma Yoga chapters. Um, the next six chapters are the meat of the sandwich, so they're the Bhakti Yoga chapters. And the last six chapters are the Gyana Yoga chapters, and probably out of the most, probably the most difficult chapter out of the last six is probably chapter 13. But we can touch on that because you're reading about that, so we'll, we'll touch about that later on. So that's the structure of the Bhagavad Gita. And then um, we looked at chapter two is important, which we'll go into in a minute, which is the entire book summarized in one chapter. And what you've got to remember is that this is a dialogue between two people, right? And because it's a dialogue between two, two people, sometimes the other person asks a question, and sometimes they're tacitly silent. They don't say anything. And Krishna then speaks. Looks at Arjuna, and Arjuna is not quite understanding or doesn't quite agree, and Krishna pushes it to another level. So you see that a lot during the chapters happening. And a very good example of that, of course, is the second chapter. The second chapter is ultimately about a series of rejected arguments, so they get to the point of where the cream of the Bhagavad Gita lies. So there's a pivot question, which is at verse 2.54, which Arjuna says, effectively asking, is somebody transcendental? What does that mean? Yeah. So we'll, we'll go backwards in a minute. And I said to you last week, the word transcendental in this context means above the modes of nature. We discussed a little bit what the modes of nature were. We'll go into that afterwards. So let's look at this chapter two and let's try and open it up. We will dip around the Gita a little bit to kind of um, get more flavours of the, of, the, of the overall content of summary. I've created an acronym to make it easier for you to remember. And uh, those who are sort of keen to really learn it, what we'll do is we'll memorise this acronym and how it functions in the second chapter over the next month or two. So you get a really confident understanding, which is what I really want, sort of, you know, what are the basic dynamics of the text and what are the basic concepts. Yeah. Yeah, so chapter two is the contents of the Gita summarised. It's in the handout. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got, you've got the title heading of the chapter. Yep. And uh, we're even going to do a quiz, probably a Christmas, pre Christmas quiz on um, chapter headings and stuff with a prize, you know. Just because I miss school so much, I have to do it. Probably I'll be here on my own doing it myself. But, you know. So let's, let's look at, let's look at the, the structure of chapter two and uh, through this acronym, which should be easy for you to remember forever transcend. You know, cause that's, of what we want ourselves to be doing. And um, the first thing is, is a command as a friend, you know? It's like, imagine there's a, there's a game of rugby or a game of football, it's half time, and you come on, and, and the guy that's supposed to be scoring all the goals, the main striker, he's just having this really terrible off day and doesn't feel like it. And you get into the changing room, you've got 15 minutes half time, and he says, What's it all worth? I can't really be bothered. I mean, look at the crowd, they're cheering like lunatics. And, you know, I, mean, I, I know we get paid a lot to be here, but I just don't really feel like it today, you know. And the manager comes in and goes, well, what the hell are you talking about? You get paid a fortune to be out there kicking the ball into the back of the net, you know. Um, so, so here it starts off with a command. And Krishna is very deliberate. And of course, you'll know by the end of the book, we'll go through the Bhagavad Gita, that, you know, he's, he's, in most, he's totally in control of what's going on here. So this is his deliberate for a reason. He goes, come on, fight. And Arjuna goes, look at those guys. I mean, I used to play with them when I was a child. I mean, Bishma and Drone, I sit on their lap. And now, now look at them, they've got foaming saliva coming out of their mouths. And the noise is unbearable. And I don't really want to do it. No, no, no. You know, and he sort of sits on the floor. <sighs> you know, and he goes, my bow is slipping from my hand. You know. So, so verse 2.7, he says, well, you know, I don't know where my duty lies. You know, um, my bow is living from my hand. Um, and then the very important sentence comes out of verse 2.7. Mantram prapangam. I am your disciple. I surrender unto you. So he surrenders unto the Lord and says, okay, the environment, everything is going on, thousands of millions of soldiers, the noise is deafening. And Duryodhana and Bhishma and Kar, you know, sorry, uh, Adrona are there, it's just too, too much. And he says, Krishna, you help me. You know? So Krishna starts. 
He goes, right, here we are. I'll help you out. You're my friend, I'll help you out. Yeah, go. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. You said from that point, yeah. the Krishna starts speaking. So before that, that's not deeper than... Well, there's, there's, it, well there's, this is a, there's a bit of a um, discussion on this, but people say that really it starts at 2.7 yeah. because because the the first step in terms of learning divine knowledge is humble submission, oh. right? So when you kind of go, I can't deal with this material world anymore. I now want to learn how to deal with it and get out of here. Yeah, so that's that place. See, what happens to people over the years, they, they come to a temple or they come to classes or whatever, and they're getting a lot of benefit out of it, but actually that deep, uh, I actually want to really take this seriously and get out of this material world, which will discuss why you want to get out of here, and why you should want to get out of here, we'll discuss that in a minute. But that has to happen, you know? And that's the point where the Lord comes in, you know? So that humble submission, you know? Until then, the Hare Krishna, whatever it is, is, is a kind of a hobby, you know? It's a kind of a, and it's good, it's a great hobby, it's a, probably the best hobby, it is the best hobby to have. You purify this, but you've got to get into that humility to get Krishna to open up the Bhagavad Gita to you. A lot of people, you know, with, with as Prabhupada rightly even puts in the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, with sort of, sort of egocistic, demoniac tendencies, try to read the Bhagavad Gita. And what happens? The, the, the byproduct of that reading and translation or, or commentary may become important or something else becomes important, but Krishna, which is the real essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Is marginalized. You know? So the Bhagavad Gita is really for the devotee to crack. You know, it's, it's written for the devotee with love. You know? It's spoken between two sort of devotee, the Lord and his devotee. You know? So, yeah, and also to just summarize, there are five topics in the Bhagavad Gita, as you know prakriti, the, the material nature, the individual selves, the supreme um, time and karma. Those are the core topics. So, 2.7 effectively is where the Bhagavad Gita starts. You know? And the starting point is, is is the knowledge of the atomic soul. You know that we are not the body, we're the soul. You know, come on, get off it. You know, what do you mean we shouldn't kill these guys? I mean, they're, they're not even going to die. I mean, you know, not even the body. You know. But here comes in the huge caveat because um, this is mentioned both in the Bhagavatam several times in the commentaries and a lot in 2.7 in the commentary of that verse, and I think 2.13 as well in the Bhagavad Gita, where it is not enough. It is definitely not enough to know that you are not the body, just the soul. That's what we spoke about last week. Yeah, this difficult concept. Because Ravana and Hirana Kasipu, Hirana Kasipu in, in the stream of Bhagavatam, the seventh canto, when he's explaining to the wives of his brother, his own wife, in the morning of uh, Hiranyaksha's death, his brother's death, who was killed by uh, the Lord in the form of a bull. That he's saying, you know, well, you know, you went on the bodies with a soul. Why are you guys crying? Come on, it's a glorious death. He was fighting Vishnu, you know, this sort of thing. But he's demonic. He knows the truth, but he's demonic. He's a, he's a demon, you know. So it's not good enough to know that you're not the body but the soul. That's that's just a starting point. Kind of gets you it's an entrance exam to get to the school, as it were. And then you've got to behave well at school and not misbehave to then learn the rest of it. So. So that, that's a very important, um, if there's like 10 core caveats to know, warnings, that's one of the most important ones. You know, and we spoke about this very difficult concept, we touched on it in chapter 13, you know, where they, they talk about the field, which is the body, and the know of the field. And the, the Prabhupada is, is absolutely a genius when he defines what level you need to get to. Because he says that it's not enough to know you're not the body. You've got to know, you've got to know what your identity is and act as if your identity is the soul. That's the bit that we all struggle with. How do you act as if you're the soul? And what's happening in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, those are your key performance indicators of whether you're actually acting in the transcendental way above the modes of nature. So, so, so we want to, we don't just say, I, I'm not the, I know, I know Bhagavad Gita, people you know trying to get Bhagavad Gita on the street. I know Bhagavad Gita, I know Bhagavad Gita, it's all about, you know, you're the soul, you're not the body, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, that, that gets you into the, into the starting block. It doesn't get you into the racing. You know, you, you might pre-qualify for Wimbledon or, or the Australian Open. Um, but you don't get into, um, Oh, I just keep
to that. Yeah. So we're just doing an overview of the bugging unit. Um, what's your name, Jackson. Jackson. Thank you. Abhijit. Abhijit. So we want to be more than that. We want to we want to know what the soul's true nature is and how it's supposed to act, as if it's not in this body. You know? That's why I got this great book, Chaitanya Charitamitra, which effectively means how should the soul behave when I mean, it's not cased in the body, what's its natural behaviour. You know, so as we go through the text, we, we can understand um, how a soul should behave in, in its pure, natural, devotional state. But let's go back before we get to that, let's go back. So, so, so in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the contents of the Gita summarised, just for you, um, Krishna tells Arjuna to fight, Arjuna refuses, then um, Krishna is saying, well, you know, you're not the body, you're not the soul. As we just discussed, that's a starting point of knowledge, you know, nowhere near the end of knowledge. And then he talks about duties. So let me try this basic argument from Arjuna to get him going. You know. And if he says to Arjuna, look, it's your duty to fight your Kshatriya uh, in, in the Varnashram system. You, you know, you're born to beat these guys, bad guys up. And that would be the end of the Bhagavad Gita. You know? There would be no need to then have the rest of the Bhagavad Gita. If that was a good enough argument. But there's like a pause. And Arjuna's not buying that argument, right? So then there's a beginning of what, 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 what the spiritual instructions are, the commencement, you know? And that is when Krishna starts talking about karma and yoga, you know? So, so the idea of, of karma in itself just means, effectively, actions which cause results. And the Bhagavad Gita context means actions that cause results that mean that you end up in another body in the material world, literally. And what we are in, as we'll discuss in a minute, is in a diseased condition. You know? We are all diseased by the material energy. We've had a, a propensity over many lifetimes to rebel against the Lord. And that's how we've ended up here. Uh, and we're all going to get old and ill and suffer, rightly, for rebelling against the Lord's love. And then we're going to have to do it all again if we haven't taken it seriously. And we think, well, this is the part of life, getting old and you know, suffering. It's, it's all normal stuff. Um, but Shash uh, Prabhupada wakes us up, shakes us out of that apathy of just thinking oh, it's all normal, we'll have a bit of fun and all the rest of it. Yeah? So karma is the, is, the, is the results that you do that create, push you into another body. And in the Bhagavad Gita, in the deeper meaning of the Bhagavad Gita, the root meaning of it is, is there are actions that you do that are designed to please Krishna's senses. And their actions are designed to please your own senses, which means that you think you still think you're the body, even if you know by reading the Bhagavad Gita that you're not the body or soul, you're still acting as if your senses matter. You know, you're not dovetailing everything you do to Krishna. You know? And um, if you have to work in the material world, um, you know, you're, in, you're in still some sort of what we call Mishra Karma Yoga, which is a mixture of bhakti and, and, and karma, effectively. So in the very last paragraph of the entire book, 18.74, in the very last paragraph of that commentary, Srila Prabhupada gives you the answer to the whole problem, which he says that your natural state is to be a pleasure giver, a pleasure giver to Krishna, and what you've become is a pleasure taker for yourself. Right? So if you imagine that Vrindavan, the spiritual world, is, is a place where all the kids play to help each other out for Krishna's pleasure, and there's a little puddle in the corner, which Krishna puts all the naughty boys in that refuse to play with everyone to please him, because they want to please themselves. They take the toys and go off in the corner and play with themselves, and they end up in the material world. Yeah. The, the, the naughty kid. Detention. This is detention. Yeah. So that's, that's how we've ended up here. And to get out of detention is very simple. You know, just follow the nine processes of devotional service. Where do you find them? They're in 7th Canto, 5th chapter, verse 23-24 of Srimad Bhagavatam. If you want to know what the devotional service is, summarised by Pallad Maharaj when he's talking to his friends and classmates um, in, that, in, that, in that chapter. So, um, we are on this path to become less selfish in terms of enjoying our senses and this body for ourselves. You know, that's where Prabhupada wants to get you by the time you get to that final paragraph at the end of uh, chapter 18, verse 74. So let's, let's, let's slowly move towards that, that direction. 
Okay. And then he goes to Arjuna, well, you know, if you win the battle, you'll, you know, you'll do something called Karma Kanda, which is like you'll, if you die on a battlefield, you get the benefits, you get the heavenly planets, you still get better bodies for more sense gratification. Right? Yeah. Or if you win, you'll enjoy the opulence on earth by doing your duty as a Kshatriya. Yeah. But Arjuna is a devotee. This is important. This is what's missed. Because he's a devotee, he doesn't go, yeah, that's a good idea, I'll go and enjoy some, let's go and kill these guys. I'll take the kingdom and I'll have the biggest party in the world. Right. Stop it there. Let's stop it around verse 2.38 or something like that. Let's stop the key to there. No. No, Arjuna's just quiet. He's a devotee, he doesn't want to enjoy sense pleasure for himself. Right. He's linked to the Lord for his soul, he's linked to the Lord. So Krishna has to go even further now. It's not going to work on Arjuna, you know. So he then tells Arjuna, look, you know, just act without thinking about the fruits of your actions. So in chapter 3 of Bhagavad Gita, which is Karma Yoga, you'll have these levels. You know, Karma Kanda binds you back to the material world, sense enjoyment for yourself, warning, bing bing, if I enjoy for myself, it's going to create karmic reactions, it's going to give me another body of some sort, you know, warning, you know. And, um, as you go through chapter 3, this, this idea will come through your head that if you ever walk through a park and see a fly, pardon me for saying this, enjoying dog, dog feces, right? It's a soul in a body enjoying some element of the material world. That's all we are. We are flies enjoying dog feces. Yeah, that's the level, the civilization we're in at the moment. Okay? That, that's where we are. So, so we need to get ourselves back to our natural state. And, and as you go on, as you become more humble, and you start seeing the world and the way the two energies is working, you understand the Bhagavad Gita, and you go to Rasa Raja's amazing classes, you'll start seeing that actually, I am just like this fly, this enjoying dog feces, you know. That sense gratification, the fly knows nothing else. You know? So the, 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 that is, you know, Nishkita, we've got, we got Karma Kanda, enjoying the senses, getting another body of some sort. And if you're lucky, you might get a nice body. If you're unlucky, you might end up, you know, uh, in some hellish world, um, you know, partly being tortured and um, partly suffering you know, as a result of the way you've enjoyed your senses. Some people, as, as, Shura Prabhupada, sorry, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada puts in the commentaries, you can enjoy in the mode of goodness the senses, or you can enjoy your senses selfishly in the mode of ignorance, or you can enjoy your senses selfishly in the mode of perhaps a passion mode of ignorance. But all those all those goodness, passion, ignorance, they're selfish enjoyment of the senses. So they're still not transcendental. They are about you. I want to do charity work. It's a good thing. It gives you a chance to approach a devotee one day. But it's for yourself. It feels good. Yeah. It's not about this it's not about Krishna. It's just about you. I accept the gospel. Give me a pat on the back, you know. This up, that's a good thing. It elevates your soul, potentially to better planets, gives you a better life next time around to potentially get into devotion, devotional practice. But it's selfish. Yeah. And she no problem part suddenly. And then later on expressly condemns it. So be warned of that. Um, so one of the things that we have to understand to progress in bhakti is we have to do an audit, firstly weekly then daily, of our thoughts and go, which ones of these thoughts are selfish, really selfish? I, I know I'm, it seems like I'm not being selfish, but I am actually being selfish. And which ones are for Krishna? And over a five or ten year process of auditing that, and cutting out the ones which are selfish, it will just increase your bhakti. Your devotional service will start to sprout, which is the natural state of the soul. So, I hope that's not too depressing. So, um, it shouldn't be. Because we have to find what we really are. That's what we're here for. Right? So the nature of tracks so at 2.54, Arjuna goes, okay, this is all very interesting, Krishna. But what what is it like? What this person, this remember this this person in chapter 13 that Chila Prabhupada speaks about, who does not identify with the body. He says, only the Shit the Shitra Jana, the knower of the field of activities of this body, which is the individual soul or super soul in this instance. The knower of the field. He will act as if he doesn't identify with his body and the senses. So Arjuna, here's a, this is a summary of the Bhagavad Gita. Here's an answer of what you've got to aim for. Here's a summary of your answer. How does he walk? How does he sleep? And all this stuff, you know? 
2.5 to 1 trillion stars kicked in. This is what we need to aim for. We can do thousands of hours of bhakti. We're not auditing where we are with our senses and whether our sense activities are Krishna or ourselves. We're not going to make that progress. We have to be critical and we have to have a goal. Uh, the goal might be today I have three selfless thoughts for, uh, for Krishna and in five years' time I'll have ten out of my 200 thoughts. And you keep auditing, you keep auditing, you go and chant, you go and do kirtan, you turn classes, you go to the temple, you, go, you know, go and hurry it on. And Srila Prabhupada has laid out a path for you that works. And as I explained last week and the week before, one the week before that, the reason it works if the Srila Prabhupada took such a risk for Krishna, is such an extraordinary devotee, because he says if you chant 16 rounds, he says if you have the four regulatory principles and you get up early. <laughs> Krishna, through the love of Srila Prabhupada, his love for Srila Prabhupada will allow that to work and purify you. So you're riding on the back of Srila Prabhupada's wave of it. You know, that's what we're doing here. It could have been 64 rounds, but no, Srila Prabhupada you know, has this amazing relationship with Krishna, and Krishna in his mercy has allowed us to get there you know, um, on 16 rounds a day. So that, that is something that we, we would be foolish not to take advantage of, considering how many times how many times we've got to be born and reborn as different things in this world. So okay. So, so that's why the, the chapter effectively ends on start some of these regular principles. Because if you start some of these regulatory principles, you will begin your dematerialization, right? Effectively, that means you'll stop using your senses a little bit self less selfishly. Yeah? A little bit less for yourself and more for Krishna. Yeah? And what we want to do is encourage that so that in the end, the only thing that really matters to you is Krishna. What you really want to enjoy is Krishna. You don't want to have anything that's not to do with Krishna. And you're going to really, like going to work is going to be like, you're taking me away from Krishna, why? You know? And then you're going to go, it's because I was a bad boy or girl, right? I want to enjoy this body, so I've got to go to work, and now I've got to get away from Krishna. But now I understand I should be with Krishna. Oh, and you're going to feel pain. You know, and that's that stop approach that happens. So that's what we want to. Do. Any questions at this point? Can you be with Krishna at work? Um, to be honest, not. You can, you can't. So there's different ways to do it. When you're actually working, um, we call it karma. Yoga, well, Karma Mishra Yoga, which is mixed. The only thing you can do, the best you can do, is give the results of that work to Krishna. Right? Because when you're actually auditing or doing a spreadsheet on the computer, focused on it, you know, unless you've got some sort of split personality, you're not going to have to think of Krishna and work on the spreadsheet. In pure devotion, it doesn't happen. Because your mind, you know, you're in a material body, your mind is a brisk material work, right? But your starting point is to give up the fruits. Chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Karma Yoga, the whole point of that structure is to get you away from actually working in the material world. Right? So if you look at chapter 12, which is the um, sort of diversional service chapter, what you'll see in chapter 12, and we'll do, we'll do all this in lots of details, don't worry, is you'll see that Krishna says, look, if, if you can't just think of me all the time, and therefore you're not completely in love with me, like you have to go and do some work. You have to feel like you've got to have a mortgage. You've got to have a car, or whatever it is. Right? Well, give up as much as you can, and I will then pull you towards me. Mm. That's the Lord's mercy. He will drag you very mercifully back to Him. You know, and that's His promise in the Bhagavad Gita. You know, so don't worry. On this path, everything is promising. You know, mm. and it will accelerate. Mm. And the more sincerity you have, the more humility you have. Those are the things you pray for: sincerity and humility. The more you will get there. Yeah? And the real secrets, the juice, you know, to get there faster is to help other people serve Krishna. Mm -hmm. Because that's being really selfless, not thinking about your senses, mm -hmm. and therefore not getting wrapped up in the material prison. Right? Chapter 4, the start of it, explains that the, the material world is a prison to reform, yeah, to reform you. Effectively, we say to refine your intentions and to reform your conduct over many lifetimes. Right? But in chapter 12, Krishna and Bhagavad Gita are saying, hey, 
Right? Imagine we are in a prison, right? It's like prison break, one of those TV programs. And somebody goes, at lunchtime, you know, I know what the parole board want. It's in this book. Now, if you get a chapter 12 in this book, it tells you, when you, when you go to the parole board, how to get out of here. So you've got to be a not very smart prisoner if you're going to ignore <laughs> what, what the parole board's guidelines are for getting out of the prison. Right? So what we want to do is kind of go, okay, I know what the parole board's guidelines are. And you've got to almost memorize them. Because if you're if you, in, in this prison, in this prison, uh, you want to get up in the morning and not just kind of wander around and so you want to go, okay, my own is parole. I want to meet all the guidelines for parole. Okay. Oh, no, I ask for diversional service. Which one is my soul in tune? Let me do that. You want to focus on getting out of there, right? Otherwise, when you get to the parole board at the end of your life, they're going to go, yeah, but you didn't really, do, you know, you really put a lot of effort in. I mean, you, you, you're starting in the right direction, but we're going to have to do the rest of the sentence. Can you bring it back for another five years or Ferrari? You, know? yeah. you don't want that, you know, at the end of your life, that's not what you want from the parole board. You know, you want to be like, yeah, it's, that's good, that's good, yeah, you know, a lot of service, a lot of helping a lot of other devotees, serving Krishna, you know, the, is, this was a real big sacrifice, you know, you get extra bonus points, you scored above the parole board of climbers, you know. And um, lots of hints in here, what a pure devotee is, what a reformed prisoner is, it's in there, you know, we're just ignoring it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. So, so that, 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 but we'll we'll do that. Don't worry. We'll, we'll, you know, I, um, you know, my my way out of the, out of the prison is to try to help some other people get out of it. You know, I'm in the prison break kind of rebellious category. I need cohorts and late, late night planning of you know how we're going to go to Melbourne the middle of the night to or something. You know, you know, we want to be that kind of fun mentality, rebellious mentality, you know, and it will break out together. You know, so just you know. Some of us start off with like a very little spoon to dig up in the prison room, bedroom, right? But with help from others, we can up, build a bigger spade and dig out faster. So, cooperation helps if you can do a prison break. Right, okay, any, any questions at that point? I'm, I'm always glossing over a lot of stuff, but we, I'm, I'm trying to help you so when you go and read it on your own, you, you've got a, a, bit of a, a, a bit of a push to get through. How, how do you determine the difference between a selfless act and an act that feels selfless but might not be? Who's the ultimate beneficiary? I sound like a lawyer there, because I am. Who's <laughs> the, the ultimate? Is, you know, when, when we talk about, um, in law, we talk about trusts. I'm running a charitable trust on behalf of the beneficiaries who are the orphans of this village. You know? um, now, I went to an expensive restaurant and spent £45 of the charity's money and myself to have lunch with my co directors. It was great fun with some. Um, and then somebody comes along and goes, but you could have like taken one of the kids with you. Or you could have bought some books for the kids in the orphanage library. Mm. Yeah. So you've got to be critical of your thinking. Mm. You know? And what we want is, uh, through many lifetimes of being in the material world, we kind of want to be teaching, go, I kind of did something that wasn't for myself, wasn't it? And you know, we know when, pardon the phrase, we're bullshitting ourselves. We just know, it's deep inside, right? We've got, we've got our own self bullshit kind of um, speedometer, or, you know, measuring device. You know, kind of, you know, yeah. I know that because I lie to myself every 20 minutes. So, you know, I'm well aware of it. You know, being ultra full of you know, I'm telling myself all sorts of nonsense all the time. But at the end of the day, I go, look, that's just rubbish. Come on, get on with it. If you, if you want to progress in devotion, come on. You know? mm. It's no different. It's, it's, it, we talked about it in the first session. It's also, there's a muscle physiological element of it, you know, habit building in the brain and getting some habits, 70 days to build a habit in the brain. And the brain thinks if it builds a habit, it starts building a habit, it'll be eaten by a tiger. That's neurology. It, it doesn't want you to develop a habit of devotion. Yeah. It's like a guy, you know, who needs to go out running because he's got a championship match, but doesn't want to do the training. And guys, look, I kind of went to the treadmill for 10 minutes and did some stretching. I'm kind of trained, but he's going to have to sprint for 45 minutes in the championship final. It's not going to cut it. You know, he knows that, but he's thinking, ah, come on. And eventually, you're like, you can, your capacity to lie to yourself because you're stuck in this body, which is naturally prone to, to cheating itself, is huge. And that's why you've got to be extra careful. Okay? Never underestimate the material energy. Right, okay, so um, I'll just go through these quotes. Well, you can read them uh, if you want. Somebody you want to read? Ready? <coughs> 
So we need to understand where we're at. Yeah? So we need to understand have a humble starting point. Yeah? So. <coughs> the bottom of the page, should have brought the part. Okay, the demons and Satyas. Rakshasas. <laughs> Sorry, the demons and Rakshasas, they are existing always. As I have told you, two classes of men are always there. But in this age, the number of atheist class or demons are very much increased. Otherwise, the material world means for the demons, atheist class. Just like the prison house. The prison house means it is meant for the criminals. One may be the first class prisoner, one may be the third class prisoner, but it is a prison house. Similarly, anyone who is in the material world, never mind whenever he is Lord Brahma or the insignificant ant, they are more or less criminals. Criminals means disobeying, disobeying the Lord or his order. They are materially criminal. <coughs> Brilliant. Okay. So just, just, I just want to give a practical bit of advice. That's why I put that question there. Okay. You know, there's four yugas. You know, um, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, and Dwapa Yuga, and Kali Yuga. And the way to remember them is Treta Yuga. It sounds like it should be the third one, but it isn't. That's the way I remember it. And, and um, so Kali Yuga is roughly 432,000 years. Um, and all four yugas constitute one Maha Yuga. And 71 Maha Yugas, if I'm right, 71 or 74, constitute Day of Brahma. Right? So, what we have to understand is there are particular types of prisoners coming to this prison. Now, if you imagine the prison now, let's go back to our prison analogy. There's A Wing, which is people, you know, kind of nicked a handbag off an old lady who's been there for six months. You know? And there's B type prisoners, and this goes on. E type prisoners are kind of murderers and villains, and, you know. And um, F type is just Donald Trump. No, F type is just a highly, like, highly elevated prisoner of really villains. You know, we've got all these people floating around, right? Now imagine you're stuck in the prison, and you go to yourself, look, you know, maybe there's other people out there who want to get out of here. They don't want to just live in the prison. They don't think they're lifers. You know, they'll go back out, do something else, and come back in. You know? But where do you go when you go for lunch? Who do you sit next to? I didn't know, you know. And the, the importance of understanding about bhakti, about devotion, and the principles of devotion is it will teach you which prisoners you should sit next to at lunchtime to help you and get some tips on how to get out of the prison and hit me the problem. You know? So that means that you've got to be careful who you associate with in the prison time, you know, in the world. You know? Because once I have a lot of souls that come here, They've lived a lot of previous lives in the middle of passion and ignorance, particularly because it's Kali Yuga. You know, it's a particular type of prison at the moment that attracts. The government's now designated this prison as D, E, and F wing, no longer A, B, and C wing, as it might have been in such a Yuga. You know, where there's kind of a little bit naughty guys, really naughty guys coming out. And they get worse and worse as Kali Yuga goes on. Right? So you've got to be discriminating who you spend time with, because they can easily influence you on the kind of basic common crime that everyone's committing, which is sense gratification for one's own senses and not for Krishna's senses. Okay? That's the basic crime that's got everyone in the prison. Right? So, so association is very fundamentally important. The more time you spend, and I remember doing, uh, doing an audit on my phone, WhatsApp, or whatever it's called, and I eventually put a huge effort in a while back to get rid of anybody that pretty much wasn't a devotee. You know. The only person on there that's not really a devotee he kind of is, is my dad, you know. It's kind of a, you know, I don't know, sort of a mis mixture of an asura and a divinity. I don't know how you go there, but that's another topic. But, you know, and because what you're then talking about when you're texting people is not, you know, what was a football score or what happened to work. Or, you text them about, you know, today we did, we did the Atheatra. I mean, we're doing the Atheatra in Coventry at the moment or something in the UK, you know, the Atheatra is going on, you know. And this happened, this debate did this over there, this person went to the Birmingham Temple, this person was in Switzerland doing a kirtan, 24-hour kirtan. You go, oh, right, that's the video for the 24-hour kirtan. So it's going on YouTube to look at some, you know, some new computer, you're going on YouTube to go, wow, they did a 24-hour kirtan in, in Switzerland, in a, in, a, in a chateau, in a castle, that's really cool. Let me know what it looks like. Wow, who's there? Okay, those guys are going, I wish I could do a 24-hour kirtan. You know, and you stop thinking about devotional service all the time. Eventually, you just think about devotional service. You know, think about it, you know, literally, you can stop work, 
you ask me. You've got your 15 minute break at work and you're going on, you know, what's that, how did that do any of that? He's in South Africa now, in the South African temple. You've got a new temple in Johannesburg, which I think opened three years ago. So, so your life then becomes, as you change your association, like when you go for lunch, it's no longer, shall I stab the prison guard or shall I nick this from the kitchen or, you know, who's got a pair of cigarettes or whatever and they talk about in the, in the, in the lunch in the prison, right? It's much more about, yeah, next, next month's parole is this, I've met three of the guidelines, I'm doing this. So then there's a commonality. And the reason Alcoholics Anonymous is very successful is because they have groups of people working on it together. They find that social environment, social pressure, as human beings, we work, we, that accelerates our development. And when you're in a prison, it's really important to kind of have the right people around you. Yeah. So that's my practical point I want to make on that. Yeah. And here's a quote just for, you know, you know, one day you know, recommend you memorize this quote because it's just amazing. Um, it's probably jumping a bit far ahead, but the spirit of reform is how you help other devotees. Any opportunity to help other devotees is, is one of the great gifts Krishna can give you into the world. Whether it's carrying something for somebody or somebody's not happy or, you know. There's so much opportunity in this call to help other people. People sit to come to say, oh, I'm frustrated, I go to RTs and I go to the temple and do this and that. And I say, whoa, what do you do? Surely there's people that need help. Surely there's people that are struggling with, with some text or something that you can give them, so you can go and learn and teach them, you know. So much opportunity. There's people. Sometimes you can, have to, you can move to another city just to have better devotional opportunities, you know, where there's not much going on. You know. In the early days, uh, in the seventies, when Shri Prabhupada was really, the mission was really getting going. I mean, there were people, um, you know, like Jayapataka Swami went to Mayapur and set up the whole thing there in the early seventies, and there was, there was nothing. It was a wasteland, a swamp. I think it kept flooding and snakes kept biting people. And, you know, so there's, there's so much opportunity in Iskon to show your love for Krishna. You know, you just can't go wrong. You just got to look for it, and that's a part of your hunger to want to serve the Lord. You know? So um, this quote is—I mean, you take this away with you. It's just for you to kind of contemplate on. You know, and obviously this is a very profound event, pastime in Chaitanya Charitamrita. So, you know, but 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 I mean, the spirit of it. Uh, you know, servant to servant to servant. I I always say that someone's taking water for somebody else is taking water and carrying that water. to to make someone less thirsty who's fanning Krishna be the person in the chain at the bottom of the chain that helps that whole chain. You know. But if Krishna is in your heart as a Paramatma, he sees your love. And his memory is infinite. He never forgets anything. The smallest thing you do for Krishna is eternal and never forgotten. Right? He has a brain far more powerful than you can possibly imagine. So don't underestimate the Lord's mercy and therefore not do little things. People don't do little things because they don't understand that the Lord's mercy is infinite. Alright, thank you. Right, yeah. Okay, so this is, um, no, now I want to go a little bit into um, into this kind of idea of why the hell do I look like this? Now, there used to be a program on TV called, um, I've obviously watched too much TV in my life. <laughs> it's a program on TV, um, I forgot the actor, but he goes back in time and inhabits other people's yeah. bodies and does something good. Uh, Quantum Leap was it? I can't remember what it was called. In the eighties, Quantum Leap. Yeah, if you remember. So, so he goes into something. He will turn up, and it's eighteen seventy in America, and he's going to stop slavery or something. And he's going to go around and stop slavery. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, we had a good time. We're going to do we got, uh, another program. Okay. Yeah. No worries. So, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's going to be a really good question. <laughs> what was it about Quantum Leap? <laughs> okay. So you got to go again. Yeah. You got to go. You can go as well. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Well, but I just learned one, one thing. Yeah. Am I going to interrupt your kind of thought? Or just no. Do you want to finish your point? I think he's moving on to a new point. I'm moving on to a new point. That's why it's a good point to leave if you want to leave. Okay. Yeah. So I should talk about modes of nature. But. Okay. Right. So just, I just learned a really nice statement hmm. by Frank Clark. And he says that um, Krishna's instruction in Bhagavad Gita is always remember me, always think of me. Mm. Um, and at the same time, perform your duty. It's the same instruction as Lord Chaitanya would say, always chant Hare Krishna, Kirtan is Hare. And so Prabhupada was saying that we should perform our duty externally. And at 
the same time chanting Hare Krishna. And then, uh, basically, that, that's sufficient, you know. But then Bhakti Vinod Thakur was saying, we should always try and perform primary devotional service as opposed to secondary devotional service. I think that's what you're saying, like, when you're at work, it might not seem like one of the nine processes, like Shravan or Kirtan or direct devotional service, you're kind of like working towards that. Yeah. But at the same time, that's a beautiful instruction that we can, mm -hmm. we can always remember Krishna while we're working, whatever it is, if you're just trying to hire Krishna, so I just wanted to. Yeah, that's, 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 kind of, that's kind of right, kind of right. Um, in, in chapter 12, though, Krishna is giving a sequence of, if you can't do this, you can do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So he gives a gold standard, which is always thinking of it. So you're not like going off to do anything material. But if you can't do that, you can start on a process to get to that point. That's the important thing. But what, what, what the important message is, is that you don't just stop at one process. You try and aim to be, always be a better devotee. So you always try and aim to push yourself through that process. But if you can't, you can't. You, you get the eternal benefit of that, you know. But if you if you really, really love somebody, like you, you know, you're a teenager and you've got a crush on someone, you know. Even if you're at school in the classroom, you'll be staring out the window thinking about them. Right? And that's where we want to get to, right? Because Krishna's saying, okay, I'll actually get rid of the karmic activity. But Technically, that's the way I was answering the question. So there, there are times when you are doing material work right. where you cannot do anything but focus on material work. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like. I, you know, I do litigation. I'm a litigation lawyer. I know, you know, there's no way, I mean, it's, the way I do is like heart surgery. If I start thinking about Krishna halfway through, you know, I'll, I'll kill somebody. I'll, I'll wipe out a business. It doesn't work like that. You know? So I have to be honest and go, I'm not the level where I can. I can if I stop my work, I can maybe, you know, by Krishna's mercy I might be able to do it. But I have got so many, this is what I was about to talk about, I've got so many impediments from my previous love of licking the bottle of the material world of previous lives, that I am, I am bound to, that's what Krishna is saying to Anjali, you're going to have to fight one way or another, because you're in the material world, you're in the material body, right? You can't just not go to the toilet. Yeah, you, it's it's part of the laws of physics of the material world. You have to go to the toilet. Yeah. See, so, you know, there'll be points when you will not be able to think of Krishna. You know, or yeah. um, and obviously that's not a brilliant example. But but so we have to be humble and realize where we are. When we look at chapter twelve, which is the key performance indicators of Krishna consciousness, if we're in the material world having to do material work, we're not spending all our time as 100% pure devotee. You know. Because otherwise we'd be fired, we'd be thinking about Krishna, you know, just chanting at work. I mean, just, you know, I've, I've had devotees work for me, come to me for work in my firm, and they don't last very long because I find them lying on the floor chanting Hare Krishna. They don't do any work. I'd like, love to keep them there, keep paying them, but I can't. You know, I have to, I have to move on to whatever they... And, and I'm, I'm really, you know, some, I've got some spiritual envy. I want to be like them. I don't want to be doing the rubbish I'm doing. Listen to people killing each other or whatever in the courtroom. You know, but I have... I'm, I'm so fallen that I've come with these bad habits from previous lives and these tendencies to want to go into litigation. You know, it's my nature, which is what I'm about to talk about. But then you can transcend that nature. You know, and there's there's a methodology to be applied, which is in the Bhagavad Gita, which is you know, if you want to get out of prison, here's what you need for the parole board. You know, you've got to read it carefully and not go. I kind of want to do that bit of what the parole board wants, but then I'm going to do my own thing and try and convince the parole board that my thing was actually a very good idea and I should be allowed out. Even though the parole board is saying that's the guidelines, you know, it's not going to be a good parole meeting. It just, 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 just you guys can go. So. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that uh, yeah. actually I was doing my the bylaws and the articles of incorporation for the Bhakti uh, BBT in the Philippines, and so when I was I was compiling the the bylaws, and I uh, I first I couldn't chant in my mind. I was so focused on like. Making sure that the articles were right and you know proper, and then so when we apply for it, everything would be correct. I couldn't chant Hare, I couldn't chant Hare Krishna in my mind. I was so focused on doing my task, 
but I had Kirtan playing in the background, so at least I, I got the spiritual sound vibration playing. Yeah. So I mean, some things, you, they need total focus yeah. and attention that you can't just chant, like even within the mind, you know, because otherwise you, you won't be able to focus on your task. Yeah, the person, what you're doing is bhakti then as well. Mm, but right. I get your point, I get your point, there yeah. are things which are so technical yeah. that you, you can't, you just can't. And you have, but then you have to admit I'm not on that level yet. Mm. And then I need to work harder on my bhakti. And with that humility and understanding of where you are, you can then accelerate. Does and that mean like yeah. quit your job? No, it, no, no, no <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't because um, it, it can do, but very rarely, because it means you have to purify yourself. You know, it's imagine, imagine um, I'm on heroin, and somebody, the doctor says to me, yeah, but if you, you want to get, if you want to feel really good, just come off the heroin, you know? Oh, so all I need to do is come off the heroin, yeah? Now, what are the chances of me stopping the heroin the next day, and in Krishna consciousness, not even wanting the heroin, not even wanting to take it, never slipping back into it, unless I purify myself, right? So, the, the, one of the messages in the Bhagavad Gita is, and it's not necessarily a message, at the end for our journey, but it's a, it's a message in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's what I'm about to talk about. Your hair, the hair on your hand, so this is what I'm about to talk about. The hair on your hand, the shape of your hair and your nose, and the face you get when you look in the mirror, that has happened because of what you wanted over many, many lifetimes. Yeah? There are impressions, some scars on the soul, and they've created this, and the instincts you have, you know, whether you like cheese on toast, or whether you like pizza, or whether you like you know, baguettes with camembert cheese in them, those instincts are driven from previous lifetimes' actions. Okay? And you can't, unless you purify yourself, you can't just stop them. Right? It's like trying to break a car that's going at 60, mile, 60 kilometers an hour to stop it or something. It won't happen. You've got to slowly apply the brakes. You've got to slowly have enough braking distance and slowly calmly come to the hole. They come to pure bhakti. You know? That's why you go through an entire process. That's why this call got an entire system in place. You, know, people go, oh, you can't do it on your own. You know? In this system, no one get rid of well, almost virtually impossible to get pro on your own. This doesn't happen. You, know? you need the system and you need other people. You know? And you have to have the humility to realise that and that's when you make progress. So anyway, you guys gotta go. Yeah. Thanks, right. Thank you for your Thank you. Um, right. So I will talk about this a um, little bit more about the modes because that's what we want to get on to the next few weeks. Um, and I'll stop. Any questions at this point apart from that?